Now the time has finally arrived to talk in more detail about certain reasons for the fall of the Roman Empire. This channel is probably one of the few, if not the only channel, dedicated only to solve the mystery of the fall of the Roman Empire. It is an extremely complex topic, countless books have been written on it and by now we have managed to firmly establish that there is no one single reason for the fall of Rome, but a complex interplay of many different reasons, all of which in their entirety caused the fall of that massive empire to some degree. In this video now we shall analyze a very big contributing factor to the fall of Rome, namely the devastation caused by pandemics. How did they happen, what damage did they cause and in how far were they responsible for the collapse of the mighty Imperium Romanum. If you are interested in the fall of the Roman Empire, then a good starting point are the two videos here in which I summarize the most important reasons for the fall, totaling 23 reasons. There certainly are more, but for me they represent the most important ones. We will go through each single one of them in future videos, because each of them in itself already represents a complex topic. But now let us start with one big contributing factor which would repeatedly wreak havoc in the Roman Empire, namely pandemics, and the resulting death toll they inflicted upon the population of the empire. This topic could not be more relevant today, since the last pandemic is still very fresh in memory and we see what terrible effects this had onto even such an advanced society as ours. Now you can imagine what terrible effects pandemics would have had on a far less advanced society with no knowledge of microbiology, no knowledge of pathogens, of viruses and of the transmittance of diseases. There are three big pandemics in the history of the Roman Empire, each of which caused an incomprehensible death toll, each of which damaged the empire and its population in unimaginable ways. The first one is the Antonine Plague. Epidemics and outbreaks of infectious diseases were a common occurrence in the Roman Empire. Especially the densely populated cities of the Imperium laid the perfect foundation for the spreading of dangerous pathogens. This, among other causes, is the reason why Roman cities were net population drains meaning they had to be constantly replenished with population from the countryside, because the average deaths in the cities outweighed the average births. In fact, nine larger outbreaks occurred in the Roman Empire between 43 BC and 148 AD. But the Imperium was spared the outbreak of a deadly pathogen for most of its existence until the year AD 165. In that year, one of the famous five good emperors ruled the Roman Empire and the empire saw itself at its peak of prosperity, of cultural development, of trade and generally of the well-being of its citizens. These were the times of the Pax Romana that had started with the Emperor Nerva and continued on the Trajan, then on the Hadrian. Then followed the virtuous Antoninus Pius, and now the empire was ruled co jointly by the famous Marcus Aurelius and by his adoptive brother Lucius Verus. Both were members of the Antonine dynasty, hence the name of the disease. It was in 165 now that the first cases of the disease were reported in the Anatolian city of Smyrna. It spread fast. By 166 it had reached Rome and by 172 it was raging in all corners of the empire. Lucius Verus himself died from that disease and large parts of the Roman army were also affected. It is thought to have been a smallpox virus with a very high mortality rate. The plague lasted until around 180 but then broke out again in Rome in 189 since as many as 2000 deaths per day were reported in Rome during that time. We have pretty good descriptions of the disease by the Greek physician Claudius Galenus. From him 
we know how deadly the disease must have been and the quite gruesome symptoms. Modern science has some trouble in reconstructing how many people died with estimates ranging from 2 to 33% of the empire's population and a fatality rate of 10%. But if it was a smallpox, which is quite likely, the figure could have been as high as 30% population reduction because the survival rate for smallpox is around 75%. If this is true, you can imagine the incredible devastation and suffering which this disease must have caused. And please like this video and subscribe so that you won't miss any future videos on the fascinating era of the late Roman Empire. And please consider supporting our work on Patreon or via YouTube membership because the long-term sustainability of this channel really depends on your support. YouTube is not really generous to such a niche topic about the fall of the Roman Empire, so in order to be long-term sustainable, I unfortunately still need your support via Patreon or YouTube membership. And we have a new Augustus member, Jean Gourdeau. Thank you so much Jean for supporting this channel in such a generous way. And of course I would also like to thank everyone who donates via PayPal. You guys are amazing, thank you so much for your support. I think Majorian would thank you for supporting a channel bearing his name. I certainly do thank everyone who supports this channel in any form. Gratias agutibi amiki. Now you can imagine the drastic implications a 30% death toll would have on such a vast empire in its prime, on its highly urbanized society, on its sophisticated trade network and on its army. It is not a coincidence that the hundred good years of the Pax Romana end around the time at which the plague had reached its highest devastation. Trade collapsed in many parts, entire cities were left depopulated, an emperor died and Marcus Aurelius would saw himself forced to settle many Germanic people from across the Rhine into the depopulated cities of Gallia and northern Italy. But a 30% reduced army size, of course, had a terrible effect on the military efficiency of the empire, and that at the worst possible time, at the beginning of the Marcomannic Wars. The Marcomanni were a Germanic tribe that were invading Roman territory south of the Danube River in what is nowadays the region of the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Marcus Aurelius was forced to recruit gladiators slaves and bandits into the ranks of the army, so dire was the situation. Yet the Marcomanni were driven out of Roman territory under great strain, but the war would continue until 180. It is entirely possible that Marcus Aurelius himself also died of that plague. And it is no coincidence that exactly after Marcus's death, would the downward spiral already start for the empire. Pandemics often lead to chaos and social unrest and combine that with the very unfortunate tyrannical rule of Commodus, who proved to be the exact opposite of his father, and we get the recipe for disaster. Massive civil wars followed and only for a brief time would the Roman Empire regain stability until the systemic problems would fully blow up some decades after Marcus's death in the crisis of the 3rd century. But the foundations for this crisis had been laid not only due to systemic problems of the Imperium Romanum itself, about which we are of course going to talk in more detail, but by the Antonine Plague. The crisis of the 3rd century began when the last emperor of the Severan dynasty Alexander Severus was assassinated by his own troops. Now would the time of the soldier emperor start, where civil wars were the norm, not the exception, where the empire split in three parts and where barbarians invaded, sacked, plundered and sometimes even destroyed entire cities. And in the midst of this chaos, the unthinkable happened. Another pandemic hit and this plague came to be known as the Cyprian Plague. It came at the worst possible time and raged from AD 249 until around 270, in the middle of the crisis of the 3rd century. Saint Cyprian, the Bishop of Carthage, described the plague, hence its name, 
and it is not exactly known what kind of pathogen transmitted the disease, but suspects include smallpox, an aggressive form of influenza, or even an Ebola virus. Exact estimates as to the death toll are also very difficult here, but at the peak of the outbreak, 5,000 people were reported to be dying per day in Rome. The population of Alexandria is estimated by some to have dropped from 500,000 to 190,000 people. So it is quite possible that the death percentage was also very high, possibly also over 10% as in the case of the Antonine Plague. This of course also weakened the Roman army so that barbarian invaders would have a much easier time in sacking and plundering many cities. It is also not a coincidence that when the plague ended, around AD 270, that was the time when the fortunes of the empire would start improving again. Thanks of course also to the heroic efforts of people like Gallienus, Claudius Goticus and last but not least Aurelian himself. But only after the plague ended would the empire stabilize again. It is quite possible that because again many Romans had died, more and more Germanic people would be settled into the Roman Empire and it is also quite possible that this plague would greatly accelerate the adoption of Christianity, finding comfort and solace in the promise of an afterlife in eternal bliss, freed from the brutal realities of life in those times, seemed very tempting to many people. The Imperium Romanum would now stay mostly free from major outbreaks for around 300 years, until then in AD 541, a new pathogen would cause the third big pandemic of the Roman Empire. And as in the case of the Cyprian Plague, it came at the worst possible time. The Imperium had just quite recently seen the loss of its western provinces. The valiant efforts of Stilicho, of Majorian and of Antemius to save the West would prove to be in vain. But the Emperor Justinian had managed to restore large parts of the Western Roman Empire through the military genius of his general Flavius Belisarius. In AD 541, Africa and almost the whole of Italy had been restored to the Roman Empire. But then a disease broke out in Egypt in 541 and then spread in the following years into all corners of the empire. And contrary to the previous plagues, it is thought that this was the first instance of the bubonic plague and not smallpox or Ebola. At its peak, 10,000 people were reported to die per day in Constantinople, utterly reducing its population. How many people died in the empire is unknown, but a death toll above 10% is again not unreasonable. Unfortunately, this came only five years after a climatic event saw temperatures drop dramatically in all parts of the empire in 536, causing widespread crop failures and famine. The army was very much afflicted by the plague and it is no coincidence that the fortunes were turning against the empire after 541. The manpower shortage led to the inability of the Imperium Romanum to keep the newly reconquered territories of the former Western Roman Empire. Already in 568, the Lombards managed to invade large parts of Italy. In the early 600s, the Slavs managed to capture large parts of the Balkans. Then a devastating war with Persia followed, which was so damaging that only a short while later the Arabs managed to conquer large parts of the Roman Empire. But the plague of Justinian set the foundations for these misfortunes and in a time where the empire would have needed stability in order to regain control of the lost western provinces and in order to restore the glory of Rome in Italy and to rebuild it from the damages of the long war, instead the empire got one of the deadliest plagues of all time shortly after massive famine had already caused devastation. This unfortunate double whammy was so severe, in combination with the devastating Sasanian War of the early 600s, that in fact the Imperium Romanum would never again recover. And from that time onwards, 
was continuing to shrink. Only one last time around the year 1000 would the empire see a miraculous recovery, but unfortunately that was also quite short-lived. We thus see how three massive pandemics, the Antonine Plague, the Cyprian Plague and the Plague of Justinian contributed very strongly to the fall of the Roman Empire. And if you are interested to learn more about the other causes for the fall of Rome, you can watch this video here in the upper right corner. But if you are more interested in when the fall of the Western Roman Empire started, you can watch the other video in the lower right corner. I say thanks again to all friends of Roman history, gratias amici imperi romani and bene valete.